Lena DeWin. Welcome to Nature of Reality Radio. Pleasure having you on. I heard about you from your interview with Sarah Westall, who was a recent guest on my program. Fascinating journalist she is of sorts. And I was very, very amazed with the things you talked about regarding what you plan to do regarding the Space Nation Asgardia thing. It seems like a, like a dreamland for the future of, of sorts. But I mean, on the other hand, we should be able to do it now, many would assert, because a lot of things are being suppressed as the technology that exists is always more sophisticated than the technology that is available in the public arena. That will, we'll save that for later in the show. But first, I need you to set the tone for this interview by giving your life story regarding who you are, how you got your position, what you experienced in your life that causes you to do the stuff that you do. And then we will go from there. So I will shut up and put myself on mute. I will not interrupt you. I don't have Alex Jones-itis. I don't interrupt my guests. So I will uh, let you talk. You've got the floor. Andrew, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's fascinating. And indeed, it was a very, very interesting chat with Sarah. So I'm pleased to hear that the word gets by and that like-minded people get connected. So thank you for having me, first of all. Uh, what can I say about myself? Um, my life story, I hear, before I go any further, I understood from our pre-show pre chat that you are very focused, very meditating, very spiritual person. So I would actually afford myself to speak more from that perspective. That would not be a typical way I introduce myself when I go on a show, but uh, you offered this tone and I appreciate it very much. So first thing I can say that anything which happened to me in life had nothing to do with what I have ever thought or planned or intellectually contemplated. So my biggest lesson learned, and I'm 51 years old now, so looking back at my life, life story is that just let it be. Uh, things which you think are for you have nothing to do with things which uh, the world has out there for you. Uh, now back to practicality, I was born in USSR, well not 100 years ago but more than 50 years ago, and my life turned out that way that uh, soon after I graduated with masters in engineering I ended up in the Netherlands for my personal reasons. And I ended up working for the European Space Agency. Again, nothing I would have ever guessed that I would leave my home country, nothing I ever guessed that I would ever care about space flight. It really, I woke up one day in the right pl place and the right time. They were looking for an engineer who could do Russian English translation. And I happened to speak English because I was a good um, student in my high school, basically. I love my English language teacher. That's why I speak English. I never studied on purpose. And that's how I ended up working in 1992-93 for Euromir programs. At the time, European astronauts flew to the Russian Mir station. And uh, then I took extra studies. I did an MBA in the Netherlands. I did a PhD in psychology, distance learning from the United States in California. So it was actually my goal to step away from uh, just being on the liaison function. So I went into promotion, education and business development for the International Space Station program. And eventually I just moved on um, with my life and uh, I worked for television. I worked as a TV presenter for Belgian television and I wrote a couple of books about space. One of them is in English. So actually, if you're interested, it's on Amazon. If you just do Lena de Winner on Amazon, you'll find that it's called My Countdown because my personal life and my business life turned out to be all circling around human spaceflight program. And I was pretty much into public lecturing and uh, being a popular speaker about human spaceflight as an independent presenter. But then it again turned out that a friend of a friend was starting uh, publishing Room magazine. So if you guys are into a very well popular way written articles about latest developments in all things spaces, be it business, economics, education, physics, chemistry, biology, anything. So it's cross-disciplinary magazine. It's called Room, Space Journal of Asgardia. The website there is room.eu.com. So room like in space, space is room, room is space. So we are in a space for talking, we're in a room for talking. So it's a platform for free 
exchange of opinions between people who care about space and are experts. So all articles there are expert articles and is distributed widely in the industry where media partners to major space gatherings like Colorado Space Symposium, like International Astronautical Federation and in particular the International Astronautical Congress, which is an annual autumn gathering. And we are sold in retail in North America. But the easiest, of course, you can subscribe online and it's at your desktop and you can look at the backlog of the archives. It's well recognized now by now in space industry as one of the leading global magazines. We're the only one who are totally independent. All other glossy, uh, very fancy intelligent publications come from the stakeholders, um, agents, Agencies, space agencies of the world uh, publish their news, so they make an accent of their own achievements. We in Rome are actually providing space for independent exchange, and that sets us apart from any publication of that calendar. So it's room.eu.com. And so a friend just asked me to work there to help setting it up, to help establishing the uh, space magazine, basically. And uh, behind it is Dr. Igor Ashurbeli. He is a uh, formerly Soviet, now Russian, scientist of Azerbaijan region, um, and he has the vast history and the background in aerospace defense, and he is an entrepreneur and a scientist. So Room Magazine was his brainchild because he saw that niche in the aerospace media market where nobody made an independent publication which would be available worldwide. And then, uh, one thing leading to another, Dr. Ashurbeli established Asgardia, the first in the world history space nation. So I was in the core team who was working already in the holding of Dr. Ashurbeli, whom he invited to join the team to be among the first to get it going. So that's how I ended up where I am and why I'm talking to you right now. Andrew and dear guests of Andrew's show, uh, it's been since day, not even day one, it's been since day minus couple of months when I was um, requested to join the core team which was putting together the opening event. And the opening, the announcement, the birth of Asgardia happened on the 12th of October 2016. And many things happened since. So. Andrew, help me here. Do you want me to keep just telling our history or do you want it to be more of a dialogue? Well, why don't you uh, keep telling the history, uh, keep it educational by all means, uh, want to uh, help people understand where this all came from so we know where it's going. So history, some people say, who cares about history? It's boring. Well, I care. Everything is fun <laughs> when it comes to outer space to me. So. Uh, by all means, keep uh, keep going. If you if, if you have more to talk about, by all means. Oh yeah, by all means indeed. So we are now at 12th of October 2016. And before we go any further into Asgardia history, I would draw your attention that 12th of October is a Columbus Day. So it has its also symbolic meaning because on that day, but more than uh, half. Um, more than 500, I believe it's 524 years earlier than Asgardia, Christopher Columbus sailed off wherever but arrived in America. So in a symbolic sense, of course, we have a world of commonality while we are separated by more than 500 years. He had just three sailboats and Asgardia is immediately gaining popularity when it goes online with thousands and thousands of people. And uh, what happened then is that honestly, we did not know how to react. So it was at 12th of October at noon, 12 o'clock uh, Paris time when the event took place. And uh, as Dr. Shurbeli said in his inaugural speech, opening speech, that uh, He's been called crazy before in his life, and he would not be surprised if he's called crazy again. He's used to that, but he expects that like with any innovative idea, it would go through the regular phases. You know, there are three phases that it can't possibly be. 
second phase is we all knew that and third phase we were at the beginning there we knew it all together anyway we have something to do with making it work so we are actually now today in the middle of 2020 already at the stage it's a fact of life so it's been less than four years and i am very proud to say that in less than four years to come to the stage that it's a fact of life which in the aerospace world in the space fan world we're very proud because out of nothing they came a first in sp world history space nation now let's talk about the definitions what is space nation why space nation what is a nation there is a difference between nation and state nation as such does not have legal definition so if a group of people is united by something unique and they they are in the position to call themselves nation Asgardia for the first time offered an opportunity for people who are not united by territory or language or ethnical origin or common um, specific historic background to unite it never happened before in Asgardia, there are 12 official languages. These are the languages by the 12 most spoken in Asgardia, and ultimately there will be an Asgardian language. Asgardian live in over 200 countries on Earth, so people are not um, similar, similarly placed geographically, or they don't have common language. And yet, they are united by the idea which transcends their current daily life. They are united by the idea that the future of humanity is in space, in space exploration, in space research, in space settlement. What does it mean to be settled in space? Settling in space means having an independent lifespan. It means ultimately a procreation. So one technical scientific visionary goal of Asgardia is the birth of the first human child in space. That is is in the vision of Dr. Ashur Belli, which he also presented a bit later, a couple of years ago, is the birth of the first human child in space. And we have already held the first scientific symposium to that purpose last year in autumn. And uh, this work is ongoing and continues, and we cooperate with scientists worldwide in that matter. But this is, of course, a very long-term goal. In order for a human being to be able to procreate in space, the human being needs to be, of course, in totally safe conditions. That means we need to have artificial gravity because human body, no matter what we do, even if we lie in bed, we're affected by gravity. So no matter how lazy you are, or I am, I don't do any sports, I'm not proud of myself, but it's a fact of life. But the very fact that I get off my bed and go to my desk, I work against gravity. It's third Newton's law. So even if you are lazy, and don't be like me, don't be lazy, but still by moving around, you are working against gravity. That's why, for example, astronauts in space have to do two and a half hours of fitness per day in order to maintain the same level of fitness as they would just by going around, minding their own business in regular life on Earth and maybe doing fitness 45 minutes, a couple of times a week. In space, after first 10 days on the International Space Station, it is two and a half hours every day. So the other, uh, so that's point one for technical purposes, because how human body operates, we need to be sure there is artificial gravity. And so, because you can say human body adapts, yes, but human body adapts over hundreds of years, and we are talking about two, three decades. So it, we need to create conditions. The other condition we need to create is protection from radiation. On Earth, we don't think about it, we take it for granted, we look up in the skies and we see infinite blue, and majority of us assume that it's infinite and very well protected. Well, there is a surprise for all of us there, a, scary, a bit scary surprise, any cosmonaut, any astronaut, no matter where people come from, no matter what their country of origin, one thing everybody sees the same way, our planet Earth is extremely fragile. If you look at the Earth from space, you just see a blue dot and you see a very thin blue blurred line along the curvature of the Earth. This thin line is not just the smear of the picture, it's how atmosphere looks from space. If the Earth were the size of a football, of a basketball ball, 
the atmosphere will be as thin as a piece of paper, as thin as a human hair. So um, all the protective layer of the atmosphere, uh, which gives us air to breathe and protect, it also protects us from space radiation. So the moment you go into low Earth orbit, and low Earth orbit is considered to be there at about 100 kilometers, that's basically a suborbital flight, and that's when you see a curvature of the Earth. These are these soon to come, hopefully, suborbital flights. So at 100 kilometers plus, you're considered to be at the low Earth orbit, and then it goes up to 2,000 kilometers. The International Space Station flies at approximately 400 kilometers, maybe a bit less. That's the optimal ratio between the amount of a propellant you need to get into orbit and the quality of microgravity, because of course there is always residual gravity. And now on the International Space Station, the absence of gravity gives opportunities to set research. What is the purpose at the moment of flying to space? Of course, to learn how to do it in a very long run, but also the International Space Station is a laboratory, a research laboratory in order to conduct research of, some, of anything, of anything on Earth, to find out how something affects something on Earth, you simply need to exclude it from the setup. But you cannot exclude gravity from setting up anything on Earth. So the only way to make proper research of how gravity affects anything on Earth is to perform exactly the same experiments in the lack of gravity. So the International Space Station is that very only laboratory where you can make real long-term research on how gravity affects anything. So they have furnaces, they have uh, biological samples, they have plants, and it's amazing. We can I can't go very deep into it because I'm not a scientist. I can only give you just some strikes of the impression how it is. For example, think of a drop of water. It has a spherical shape. So physics is totally different. Think of a flame of a candle, it's totally spherical shape. So all the convection physics laws are different. Uh, the plants, if you grow plants, here we expect that the uh, roots go down. In space, roots of the plants go uh, horizontal. So actually, we always assumed, well, we scientists always assume that it has to do with the uh, gravity laws per se, but they found out by space research that uh, roots of the plant grow against the velocity vector. So it gives even new idea about the growth of plants. And of course, they draw a lot of biological samples from people. And by doing so, they find out how lack of gravity affects human body. And it can potentially be detrimental because going back to what I said about 10 minutes ago, uh, you don't have even the third Newton's law that the Earth hits you back with minus F when you step on it. So the loss of muscle strength, the degradation of bones, that all gives a test bed for developing at high speed osteoporosis, what the old people on Earth are prone to. So thanks to microgravity research, some medications have been developed which help people to prevent osteoporosis. But where we stand today, of course, this is still a very, very daring adventure. So for people to be able to live and procreate a space, tons and tons of work in physics and in biology have to be done to make sure the human body, the female body, the period of gestation, the baby, that everybody is safe and sound and fully supported and protected and the conditions, including microgravity conditions, are turned into artificial gravity, maybe at least in some parts of the station, and we are protected from radiation. So that was a long story, the purpose of which was to show how complex and um, visionary is the technical goal of Asgardia, to achieve birth of the human flight and uh, child in space. And by doing so, we prevent um, dis disappearance of human species because uh, let's assume we conquered COVID, everything goes well, and we protect ourselves from space threats, which can be natural or man-made. So there can be meteorites, asteroids falling on our heads, but there are also already plenty of dead satellites, which potentially have a chance to fall on our heads. So there are natural 
and artificial sources of potential dangers, but also, hopefully none of this happens, some billion years away, two, three billion years away, okay, not in your and my lifetime, but still, the it's forecast that the crown of the sun would expand in such a way that life on Earth will be impossible. So, okay, it's not 25 years away, it's some billions of years away, but still, you need to do one small step in that direction. For human being to survive as a biological species, it needs to be able to procreate and be fully self-sustainable in deep space. That's what Tsiolkovsky said at the beginning of the 20th century. It's a famous quote, I'm sure that you're all space fans here know what I'm about to say, that uh, Earth is the cradle of the humankind, but a human being is not meant to stay in the uh, cradle forever. Stephen Hawking is known to have said that species bound to one planet are uh, bound to extinction. So Asgardia is thinking exactly in those terms. So that's the vision of Dr. Shurbili, the founder of Asgardia, to achieve birth of the first human child in space. And coming back to where I started about the notion of the nation, the nation is unification. The motto of Asgardia is one humanity, one unity. For the first time in history, nation is formed out of intention, out of intentional conscious free will of the individuals who joined. It's not just by birth or uh, excuse me, not just by language, not just by the place of origin. It brings the whole different consciousness, the whole different idea of responsible living, of transcending borders. And that in itself is also looping into the essence of Asgardia, which does not see borders. When cosmonauts, astronauts look at uh, Earth from space, they all unanimously say there are no borders. From space, you only see the shapes of the continents. You do not see borders, which we as humans have in our minds and have on our maps drawn on paper, drawn on, well, on our gadgets by now. So the whole notion of Asgardia is that there are only continents and people who are united. And Asgardia transcends borders, Asgardia transcends earthly nations, Asgardia fully respects what's happening on earth but is moving forward in this new consciousness and in doing so the geopolitical goal of Asgardia and we can say astropolitical that's the term coined by Dr. Shurbeli is that Asgardia is eventually going to become a member of the United Nations it will be the first space nation another angle of the nationhood so we have a population. Population are people who registered on asgardia.space. We talk about it further um, separately in more detail. You can talk about territory. Now, that's a very interesting thing. We do have our own satellite. It's a CubeSat, 2U CubeSat. It was launched in November 2017. So Asgardia's territory is its satellite. I know it might sound a bit challenging to begin with, but let me explain. Normally, of course, you think territory, you think piece of land. But there is only one law, and it's the law we have already discussed. It's a law of gravity, which holds the surface of a country, any country, to the surface of planet Earth. There is no law which says that the country must be the size that it fits its entire population at any given moment. There is no law which says that the entire population or any pe person of that population for that matter is obliged to live in the country of their territory. So Asgardia has its territory and it's floating around the Earth, it's orbiting the Earth as we speak. You can see exactly where our satellite is on the map, which is on Asgardia.space. And uh, it is carrying the data of anybody who is as guardian and wish to send their data. It's, they could people send pictures or whatever. It was their free choice. What do they want to upload to the satellite, which is orbiting the Earth? So you can say that we are a population over one million people because that's the number of registered as guardians. 
and our territory is Asgardia 1 satellite, which is orbiting the Earth at about 500 kilometers, I believe it's right now. And you can see exactly where it is by visiting our website. So, Andrew, to you. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very informative there. And like I said in the pre-show conversation, I have always, since I was a young kid, wanted to be an astronaut. They always say, what do you want to be when you grow up? My answer was always an astronaut. But the probability of becoming an astronaut is extremely small and very, um, it's a very risky business, they say, as you explained, because of the things that go on when you have to go up into the um, into the cosmos, you're entering a whole new environment. Now, we have been suckered, apparently, into believing that outer space is not what we are led to believe it is. Um, I've actually heard some people say that the idea that outer space is a vacuum is a lie. In reality, outer space should be more thought of as a plasma ocean of sorts, and you can actually see there are visual footages. NASA will try to um, chop them off and delete them if they ever come to the public arena, but there are images what, of what appear to be gigantic, like, sea creatures in space that are siphoning energy off of stars like like our sun and this raises the question okay we have to understand that our understanding of outer space is not what mainstream science has led us to believe it is the how does that factor into asgardia i've even heard um cliff high the webbot guy he actually said the sun is not visible from outer space. I don't know where he's making that um, assumption as to what it, what it, what what the problem is regarding the frequencies and the the spectrums allowing for your, for a human being who's in outer space to see the sun or any other stars. But he says it would not be available uh, visible from space. Do you have anything to say about this uh, idea that outer space is not what we're led to believe and stars and the sun cannot be seen from space? Well, um, you are lucky here. I have an opinion about everything in the world apart from uh, sciences, which I am not a specialist in. So, yes, I can give you also a broad view on the subjects you have addressed now. Now, first of all, before we go any further, I want to make a very clear statement. I do not believe in conspiracy theories for a very simple reason. Think of trying to organize a group of people to do anything. Like we can confess, Andrew, to your listeners that a two took us some email exchanges and cancellations to meet, and we are just two people who are pretty much independent in uh, fixing their own schedules, and even that took an effort to make this appointment. Think about organizing a group of people. Think about yourself as kids being organized. I do not believe in conspiracy theories for a very simple reason. It's impossible to organize groups of people to do something efficiently and in a way that information does not leak. People are clinically incapable of holding secrets. There is not even out of ill intention, simply because they don't think far ahead and don't contemplate it well enough. So for me, a reason of organization and chit chats and rumors and information going through, conspiracies don't work. It takes too much effort and it's against human nature. Having said that, think about another concept. Think what is infinity. Honestly, can you grasp the notion of infinity? I can't, because not, I kind of can grasp the idea that something will go on and go on and go on, doesn't matter if I'm an observer or not. But I certainly cannot grasp the notion that it's always been, that there is no beginning. I kind of can understand what is no end, but I really can't understand what is no beginning. So we're talking about time, which has no beginning and no end, and we're talking about dimension, which has no limit. So we are a tiny particle of something, as opposed to nothing, in the scale which, has, which lasts forever. If you talk about stars in the sky, if you think of every grain on, of sand on planet Earth, 
there are more stars in the sky than there are grains of sand on planet Earth. Can you grasp this concept? I personally can't. So talking about something being hidden from us by scientists, honestly, I don't think, unfortunately, that we're advanced enough to have scientists who know it all. You, it's like in Newton times. It was a huge achievement to know what Newton has known. And, until, and it explained more or less things around us until Einstein came by and discovered yet other set of things, which explains things far beyond the surface of planet Earth. And honestly, I'm not clever enough and I'm not educated enough to understand what it means. But what I know for a fact that the work serious scientists are doing in physics and cosmology, it cannot be done without the basic discoveries of Einstein. So it could not have happened even 100 years ago. So the same. Who says that Einstein reached the ultimate top? Maybe there are still things to discover. People are talking about quantum physics, quantum computers, basically the best I can understand, and I'm sure I'm not able to understand it any further, even if somebody tries to explain to me. We now operate in binary, so in computers everything is zero and one. And quantum basically is that there are three units. There is also something between zero and one. So it multiplies enormously the capacity of the computer and the complexity of its mode of thinking. Again, I'm saying words which somebody tried to explain to me. I don't really understand what it means and I'm very realistic about it. So think where we are and what is infinite universe. So assuming that we are the only biological life on Earth, assume in, sorry, in the universe, assuming that we are the only intelligent life in the universe, and I'll repeat and emphasize again, universe is infinite in terms of its dimension, and it's infinite in terms for how long it has been existing and will exist. How can we possibly be so arrogant to assume we are the only ones? So maybe is the question you have not asked, but I assume it might come up, so I answer it straight away. If there is extraterrestrial life uh, out there, no, cosmonauts have not seen green aliens flying by and waving at them through the windows of the space station. But is there life out there in space? My answer is, of course, there is. The space station is flying 400 kilometers off the surface of planet Earth. 400 kilometers, it's what you guys probably in the States easily drive. I know it's a very strong driving culture. It's what drive from New York to Washington, I suppose. 400 kilometers is 300 something miles. Uh, and infinity, compare 300 miles versus infinity. Uh, and OK, there are, of course, there is Hubble telescope. There are probes which have uh, flown outside of our galaxy. Yes, but these are just few cases. They're just touching upon something. So it's impossible to hide secrets. It's like you take one molecule of air and you question yourself, am I breathing in this particular molecule when I am in an assembly hall? There is no answer to this. And infinity is bigger than just number of molecules of air, no better no matter how big the assembly hall is. So I simply cannot even put my mind to giving a more rational answer to this. Answer, do scientists hide something? No, you cannot hide something which you do not have. We do not have the total knowledge about what's out there. So you cannot hide something you don't possess. So if something is not told, it's simply because it's not known. And no, I do not believe that NASA deletes files with uh, information which comes through. I believe that they analyze it and give it intelligent explanation before they make popular publications. But I would never believe that they hide alien life which reached out to us, but they just prevent us from meeting it. Andrew, to you. Okay, fair enough. I, I have said many times in the old days of doing this show that well, I'm going to say it again, I hate saying it, but the fact of the matter is pretty much every significant government secret and conspiracy has been exposed at some point or another by researchers, conspiracy theorists, and festive journalists. The problem, though, is that 
it's easy for governments and corporations to get away with their secrets and conspiracies being exposed and the reason they get away with it so easily and nobody gets in trouble and nothing is done about nothing is done to harness the conspiracy being exposed is because the people of planet earth we are so paradigmatic so fearful and so flat out stupid that we will refuse to believe something shocking or disturbing even if the evidence shows that they have no choice but to believe it. And people like Richard Hoagland have made it clear that they do not want to talk about things that will frighten the human race regarding our position in the, in the cosmos. Alex Collier said that he approached Richard, Richard Hoagland and asked him, why won't you tell the world that the moon is artificial? And Richard Hoagland said, because I'm not ready to, which is a nice way of saying, I don't think humanity can handle the truth. So, how do you um, want to... I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with uh, this distinguished gentleman and with his works you probably are referring to here, but again, I'm not capable of maintaining an intelligible conversation on the subject of a moon being artificial. I'm sorry uh, for that. I'm not a scientist, but I'm educated enough to uh, know what I know. And uh, I'm not a teacher of um, astronomy or physics, so I cannot just now build an argument, but simply it doesn't make any sense to me. I'm sorry. It's all right. I uh, will switch gears and uh, talk about other things regarding outer space. Uh, the idea that astronauts have to um, Exercise Andrew a lot. Lost you. Oh, Andrew? Oh, oh. Can you hear me? Are you there? Hello? Andrew? Hello? Oh, oh. Are you out? Andrew? I can't hear you. Hello? Andrew? Are you there? whatever the reason, maybe because we're talking about some <laughs> significant stuff, but let's keep this going and I will make sure that I edit that out when I upload this to sure. the... Uh... No, please. Okay, so I wanted to talk about the thing regarding astronauts um, floating in outer space. The common conception is a misconception of sorts when they say that astronauts float because there's no gravity. Well, they're not in a zero gravity environment. There's gravity all around them. They are actually in a state of free fall. It's basically when you, if you were in a box and you drop the box and the, you would float around in the box as it's falling towards the earth. But that's getting closer to the Earth. The reason the astronauts in their spacecraft aren't getting any closer to the Earth is because they and the Earth are both curving in towards the center of gravity, which um, causes them to be in, in an orbit. And that's really complicated for a lot of people. So people sometimes just say there's no gravity in outer space, but that's, of course, um, a misconception. But the point I'm trying to make here is regarding that, what can be done to enable people to not lose their bodily essence? Because astronauts have to exercise a lot when they're in space and all, and what, what would they have to do to prevent decay and atrophy from, yeah. from space gravity, zero gravity illusion? Okay, so let, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And let me try to make it maybe a little bit simpler because I'm used to giving lectures also to young school children. And what I do in class with young school children, first question I ask them, have you ever dreamt, have you ever seen yourself in your dream or sensed yourself in your dream falling? So first of all, and most people say yes. So first of all, the sensation of floating in zero gravity is that. 
if you ever dreamt yourself falling in your dream, that's how it feels. When I'm with very young kids, next thing I tell them, now in your chair, lean forward, just fall with one foot. And this moment is a moment of free fall. That's what it is. Every time you make a free fall, you step forward, it's a fall. Gravity like, is what's holding us on Earth. And microgravity, you're in a permanent free fall. What do you do to escape? So any physical body have gravity. I have gravity, you have gravity. If I'm heavier than you, my gravity is bigger than yours. So any physical body indeed has gravity, but it's all relational. So what is necessary for a rocket to launch and to overcome gravity? It needs to develop velocity. It's called escape velocity of eight kilometers eight something kilometers per second. So it's a bit lower in miles. And that means that the space station, so that's how it manages to uh, go away from the gravity of Earth. And after eight minutes, it reaches the outer space. That's when, if you watch the launch, they call it microgravity sensor, but basically they hang on a rope, a little toy off the roof of the launch vehicle. And when it starts floating, that's how you tell that you are now in microgravity. You see this shock, the third stage of a rocket goes off. It's a shock which is visually noticeable. And then you see that documentation cosmonauts hold in their hands is lifting up. They're a little bit lifting up, even though they are very neatly tied up in their seats, which are crafted for individual bodies. That's so important because g-loads are very heavy and you see this little toy which is called microgravity indicator floating but that is because you are at let me think it's 28,000 kilometers per hour or it is 17,000 miles per hour so if you look at the footage from the international space station i know these numbers exactly because in the a core module of the space station. They have it. One of the things which is there on the walls as a joke is the speed limit, 28,000 kilometers or 17,000 miles per hour. So speaking of walls, that is a earthly construct. It does not make sense in space because the uh, ceiling or the floor or the right wall or the left wall is depending on where you're floating right now. So it's only the agreement they normal uh, sometimes they color code the different surfaces in order to agree what is the wall and what is the ceiling so it purely depends on which direction you are turned when you are floating now about the floating itself of course there is residual gravity that's why indeed it's called microgravity not uh, weightlessness because operation of the equipment for example it has some vibrations and vibrations create gravity. Also in the lack of gravity, there is no airflow. In normal Earth environment, we all know that warm air rises up. And when you breathe, the air you breathe out, the CO2, it's warmer, so it flies away from you, it rises up. So as long as you're just in a normal room and with no doors open, closed, air conditioning going, windows closed, open, people come and go, we are all okay to breathe because CO2 is naturally floating away. There is natural floating of air because of the physics of gravity. In space, this is not the case. You need to circulate the air. Otherwise, for example, the only private space a cosmonaut has on board is his sleeping cabin. Everything else is the work environment and common areas. So the sleeping cabin is basically uh, a meter by meter by two, so where you can uh, tie yourself with a sleeping bag, and it has to have special ventilation. First of all, you need to go into the sleeping bag, otherwise you will float away. And then you have to have ventilation because otherwise you have a cloud of CO2 which you breathe out and you will suffocate. It's deadly. It needs circulation. So that's a difference. But of course, ventilators work throughout the station. So the rule of the thumb is that if you lose something, you just hope to find it by floating to the ventilation grids because there is a chance it's been 
uh, sucked in that direction and you find it on the surface of the ventilation grid. Or that's what you do, for example, when you need to cut your nails. The very simple things which for us are common on Earth are a matter of safety on board the space station. For example, if you cut your nails or you cut your hair, you need to be sure it doesn't float anymore. Yes, it's not total weightlessness, but yet it's microgravity. It floats, it's very light, and gravity of human body is not strong enough, but the airflow makes them not only hang in the air, but also float. And what here falls on the ground, and in the worst case, you step on it or you just swipe it up, in space can get into your eye. It can, you can breathe it in. It can be a medical hazard. So when you have a haircut, somebody is there with a hoover, not only with the scissors, because all the hairs have to be sucked up. If you are there cutting your nail, nails, you better do it over ventilator grid so it doesn't float away. So you collect it over a tissue which is held by the suction of ventilator grid, and then you throw it away. Uh, at the same time, uh, this lack of gravity and evaporation creates a totally different cycle of uh, water circulation. Human body needs two liters of water per day just for biological functioning. That's a given, that's provided. But again, people uh, find it unimaginable, but for six months in space, and that's an average duration of the flight nowadays, people do not have a shower. For any hygiene purposes, they use wet wipes. So the amount of hygiene water per person per day is a glass. It's 300 milliliters, just a normal drink bottle with one portion of drink. So this is the amount of liquid which is soaked in the wet tissues with which people wipe their bodies. And then water is, of course, is a very valuable, very scarce resource. There is a system for recycling, regenerating the water. So not only some supplies are brought from Earth, but absolutely everything which is water is then used for recycling. So you hang up those wet wipes and they evaporate and those vapors are collected and water is processed out of those vapors. The same, you have very limited supplies of clothes. For one week, your uh, training suit, for example, how you go around is your daily clothes. Next week, that becomes your fitness clothes. But when you're done with your fitness run for today, you hang up your T-shirt and your sweat evaporates. And also the liquid part is reprocessed into the water. And actually, there is a difference in processing systems. Technically, it's becoming perfectly distilled water. So even human urine is processed into a fully distilled water. And then for the cosmonauts, the astronauts have a joke that the coffee that we and our friends drank yesterday is the coffee that we and our friends drink today. And it's a coffee we and our friends will be drinking tomorrow. Because then in the American segment, the distilled water is then um, replenished with vitamins and minerals and is becoming perfectly fine potable water. It's only a question of psychological comfort that you can drink the reprocessed water which uh, first came through those uh, cycles which I have spoken about a minute ago. The same, you need amounts of water to, for food because food needs to be stored without any refrigeration for many, many months. So an average rule of thumb is that when something is sent for, to space to be used as nutrient, it needs to be good without refrigeration in ambient conditions for about three years. So a lot of science has gone into freeze-dry, into other processes, in dry sublimation of foods which are taken to space. And then all of this needs to be replenished with water, needs to be left to soak, and then it's becoming a food which is kind of familiar to us. But again, take my word for it, I had an opportunity to taste plenty of space foods and definitely it's, you don't go to space to have nice cuisine. Yes, and I have a lot of storable food myself that is looking pretty good now with the economic shutdown. I try to eat a lot of it and learn to like it. The uh, food should be tasty. Uh, but it's not a not a banquet or cuisine for sure because of the way it has to be preserved. I no question about that. 
Now, uh, I'd like to uh, get a little political and such. It has been brought to my attention that Vladimir Putin, of all people, may actually be the one who is going to the forefront of humanity, getting us to get with the space race, because, well, you remember back when Vladimir Putin gave Snowden asylum, and Vladimir Putin actually said, do not expose anything that makes the American government look bad. Everybody was taken aback by that because Vladimir Putin, with Russia today, he loved making things look bad uh, for America. RT made a made a living out of disgracing the American um, country and the government, and so it seemed shocking that he would not allow Snowden to expose that information and tell him, "I will." keep you uh, safe as long as you don't expose it. Well, the problem is Putin is being puppeted by everyone, uh, like all the other world leaders. And the thing, though, is they have lost a lot of control now, and Putin is becoming more of an angel of sorts, I, uh, word on the street is. Uh, and he may have had a valiant Thor meeting of sorts, where he uh, talked with extraterrestrials to um, enhance humanity's ascension into the cosmos. Does any, does any of this resonate with you? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. First of all, I'm talking to you in my capacity of head of administration to the head of nation of Asgardia. And by Asgardian declaration of unity and constitution, Asgardia does not interfere into earthly affairs. So very simple, I have no stand on earthly politics. Uh, Asgardia as a nation welcomes cooperation with the nations which have space research and in particular Asgardia is welcoming cooperation with all the other nations because today space is a in a way, exclusive club of 20 odd countries who have independent access of ongoing research activities, whose, con whose governments are having their own space programs they're investing into. But at the same time, there are plenty of uh, very brilliant scientists everywhere in the world, but they come from the countries where the country is, where their governments do not invest. So that's one thing where Asgardia is opening the world of opportunities for humanity and to, for the leading scientists, and at the same time bringing back to the entire humanity the results of space research, because of course every national government is caring for their own interests and benefits. Asgardia is there for humanity. So I, again, I apologize, I'm probably disappointing you by not picking up that conversation you are offering because simply it's beyond our sphere of interest. So we do not do earthly politics, but at the same time we are inviting it for cooperation everybody who wants to cooperate of the spacefaring nations, but in particular the other countries who do not yet have their own national programs. As Guardia is the way to unite around it and to make space equally available to everyone. Because look, if you look at the Outer Space um, Treaty of 1967, it actually says that space should belong to everybody and benefits from space research should be uh, available to everybody. So we are actually going by the book. We are mirroring this in our internal documentation and commitments, and we are open for cooperation with anybody, no matter where they come from. We are clearly out of earthly politics. Well, that's great. And the sooner we can get to outer space, the better. Although, when it comes to going from star system to star system, how did extraterrestrials do it? The question, uh, the way they do it, most people think is a wormhole, or maybe they're bending and curving space-time, like the whole Bob Lazar thing, where you can bend and warp space-time by bringing it closer to you, so you can travel farther there into the, into the future, too, for that matter. 
And of course, when you're traveling at a very fast rate, you are traveling into the future faster than those who are on Earth because of the pho phenomenon known as time dilation. So does that factor into, um, into this or is there a way to counter the time dilation factor regarding um, traveling through space? I believe this will become uh, actual some decades, if not centuries away, because when we talk about, again, procreation in space and the scientific and technical goals, which are very realistic, and Dr. Shurbeli is personally committed to seeing them through in his lifetime, uh, this is not going to be a parameter which we will have to take into account. This will still be happening in the low Earth orbit. But indeed, it, it's in the long, 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 long term vision of Asgardia is to have interplanetary travel. And that, of course, might take precedence. Those things need to be taken into account. The best answer I can give you now, and it's not at all scientific, but I happen to be... Um, to know something about Star Trek, the best answer I can give you is that both Earth and Asgardia are so far pre-warp drive civilizations. So we are not in the position to give it a realistic judgment. Yes, Star Trek, <laughs> Star Wars with the travel through transporting, it basically takes, um, takes effect exploit the fact that space and time are illusions to be able to go from point A to point B. And I've always had an issue with that, like, well, how did the extraterrestrial um, get to point B to be able to travel from point A to B in the first place? And the time dilation factor is all, uh, all well and good, but Regarding the future of humanity and when this stuff can come out, uh, Donald Trump, you know, his uncle was one of the people who suppressed the Nikola Tesla technology when Nikola Tesla passed away. So Donald Trump, you would think, probably has some of Nikola Tesla's technology, which could make the bankers and the oil tycoons and and everyone else go out of business and we would be able to live in a harmony on earth and be able to go through space it's, it's a dreamland like i said at the beginning of the show but then again it's there but it's not coming and there seems to be some resistance so for lack of a better question what can be done to speed up the rate at which this can happen so that we can finally get to meet our space brothers? Honestly, I don't know. Again, I can share my immediate reaction to the inputs you're providing, but these are just my private thoughts. I think that these, there is a natural course of events. You cannot just bypass stages of development. And I personally, for my own reasons, I'm not claiming that this is a profound philosophy behind it. I believe that things happen in the right time. You were talking about taking whomever, tycoons and bankers, or who you named other professions, you talked about taking them out of business. I'm personally against taking, I'm, I'm against destroying. I, again, as a person who was born in the USSR and witnessed collapse of the USSR and had all that education on the one hand, but all my grown up life since 1992, I live in the West, in the old West, you can say, I mean, old Europe and travel a lot around the world. And I lived many months in the States. So I'm familiar enough with the Western world and I have personal experience of the Soviet world. So my whole personal experience and education of USSR is destroying for the sake of building is a wrong approach because that's exactly what happened in the USSR in the 20th century. It was one of those slogans which in general terms, if I translate it, it would be first destroyed down to the foundation and then we build a new world. It doesn't work. 
it's a lifetime experience in my lifetime. So I'm personally, first of all, against the philosophy of let's destroy and let go of something because it doesn't work. Just destroying for the sake of destroying is not a program. Like opposition is a program which makes things work differently. Opposition is not being against. So that's one thing. The other thing is, of course, we can talk a lot about the unfairness of the modern world and how we got there. It will be a different subject of the program. It's a very interesting one, but I'm not sure exactly how it relates to space exploration, which you announced as the subject of this program. I personally, again, can only refer to that as Guardian is for everyone. So <laughs> the only condition, of course, you need to have a gadget and go online, otherwise you won't be able to register and to register we welcome anybody who shares the values and the vision of Asgardia where everybody is equal, everybody is united, so one humanity, one unity and all of this you can find in detail at asgardia.space and register there in a few clicks. So what comes to extraterrestrials, again, I have no opinion if it's good or bad, we don't know what is life out there. One of the scientifically recognized threats from space is threat from other biological lives. Because when we talk extraterrestrial, we naturally assume people, not quite people, not quite looking like us, but somebody comparable. But actually, again, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but it's a bit less romantic because any biological form any biological molecule, any organic molecule is a life form. If you think back to your biology class from uh, early mm, high school years, uh, you would remember that the basic uh, monocellular bodies, they are already organic life forms. This damn COVID virus is just a few cells and it puts the whole planet to stand still. So biological life form which can affect us is not something we need necessarily to strive to encounter because this panspermia as a concept is one of the threats which is considered in meteorite strikes. It doesn't mean meteorite can fall on your head, of course, there is always a probability. It's a mechanical damage, maybe death. But even if meteorite falls in the middle of a forest and doesn't hit any person, anybody, not even noticed by anybody apart from the radar stations, you don't know which microbes, which molecules, which life forms, biological life forms, organic chemicals can be on the surface of that meteorite. And you do not know how it can affect the soil and how it can propagate and what it can do to our plants and what it can do to our animals. Because think, if you just travel cr cr across Atlantic, if I fly from Europe, I can only bring, I don't know, chocolates, candy. I cannot bring any meat, any apple, anything, even if I'm eating it on board the plane, simply because my apples in Europe grow in different conditions than your apples in the United States. So you can't bring any livestock. Think about it. You travel to Australia, to New Zealand, you travel to the other continent and in your customs declaration you talk about having any biological materials with you on board, not in the sense of biological weapons or something chemical or something laboratory, no. You're simply talking about having a banana in your luggage. It's as simple as that, an apple, a banana, uh, uh, a peach, you may not bring it into another country simply because in your country it might have been processed by the other uh, materials and it might be growing in a different soil and the soil of the other continent, of the other island would be affected. Think some years back, you probably, well, okay, it doesn't affect you, you live in the States, but in Europe it was a problem until 10 years or 15 years ago, if you had a dog, a cat, a pet with you in a continental Europe, you could not go with it into United Kingdom. You would be in quarantine for the pet for six months. People, I know a lot of expats who live between continental Europe and United Kingdom, and it was a big consideration for them to relocate back home to United Kingdom because they didn't know how their pets would survive the quarantine, simply because they don't. Uh, they were afraid of rabies, which were considered not to be totally eliminated in Europe, but also because of their other biological substances which come with them. So the life form, which is extraterrestrial in a very unromantic way, is a threat in bacterial form. 
next time it can be, okay, don't now quote me on this because some conspirologists would love to pick it up if I say that COVID might have fallen off the skies in the meteorite, but basically it's as bad. Something literally can fall out of the sky and become an epidemic because we simply do not know which life forms exist, where they could have crossed which path and how it could end up on Earth. So when we talk about extraterrestrials in this excited way you're referring to, people normally mean friendly green little people. But what happens in reality? Yes, there is forms of life. I believe there's been discovered that there is some form of life on Mars, for example, because ice was discovered. Ice means water, water means hydrogen. So it means the possibility for organic life. Organic life exists and we know it. And it's dangerous for us because we don't know how it will interact with our atmosphere, with our soil, and what impact it would have on our whole natural uh, life cycle. What concerns the little green men? I personally do not know anything about it. There is only one joke there. Uh, which I love personally. I find it okay, cynical enough to reflect our reality. So uh, the very fact that very intelligent life exists out there is proven by the fact by that they managed to avoid us so far because we are so irrational and so stupid. They managed to avoid us, so they clearly exist and they're very clever. Yes, humanity does have a long way to go to be able to get up to the chain of the, well, the Terminator movies were in 2030 when that was a negative timeline when they sent Sarah Connor back to kill, um, uh, sent the Terminator back to kill John Connor um, so that the Terminator and the machines could rule the world. Of course, we are on a positive timeline where we get to work with machines and be one with nature. And humanity needs to become one with nature in order to expand its consciousness. No questions about it. And what do you think is the best way for humanity and machines to get along so that we don't become so fixated on the machines that it takes away from our chance to go out into nature. I remember from my childhood when my parents would tell me, you should go outside and get some fresh air. And I was playing on my computer because I love the computer games. But now I realize nature is definitely, definitely worth becoming. And outer space nature, that's a whole new can of worms. So regarding how humanity can interact with machines and interact with nature, do you have any comments on that? In the lack of nature, uh, did I understand the question correctly? How can humanity interact with machines in the lack of nature? How can humanity and machines interact with each other when, while still being one with nature? Mm, that for me is a complex matter. I don't think in those terms because again, I would refer to what I have already mentioned. For me, there is natural progression. You cannot jump cycles, you cannot jump generations, you cannot come, like, you can, people from 500 years ago, they were no less intelligent than us, but if you take somebody from 500 years ago and put them into the modern world, okay, the language issue aside, it will be very difficult to catch up with all the modern way of living, of all the tools, because simply as a gr you need to grow up with this. You need to be like our children, our grandchildren, they're digitally native. Uh, uh, my granddaughter does something which naturally, which I still need to think about, and she is four and she does it naturally. So it's totally different world. 
And uh, for me, if anything, I'm learning from the kids to let go and try to be intuitive about things about which I tend at my age to be intellectual. So for me, the problem can come if we try to skip steps. That's what I observe. Uh, and it's for a reason evolution exists and it's for a reason we are human beings, not human doings. I think we tend to forget it actually, and that's where a lot of problems and a lot of uh, misunderstandings and stresses and burnouts comes from because we, for whatever reason, set ourselves value targets which are defined in measurable achievements which are quantifiable through activity and through earnings and through possessions. And I can only hope that actually getting machines to do the work for us, because effectively that's what further prog progress means, that a lot of work is done by external um, unhuman entity. Yeah, so humans, biological life forms, let's say, if we can generalize humanity to biological life form, becomes actually a responsible and grateful user because, okay, it's with a mixed feeling that I'm being ironic saying a life form is because what I observe is that there is a group of people who are moving science forward and then there is a big group of people who just sit back on their telly. You know, the achievement of the 20th century is flight to space, the achievement of the 21st century is how many channels do I get on my Sky TV? That's um, in a way sad. <laughs> So for me, the question is, and again, we're deferring to a totally different line of thinking, which I find it personally very really interesting, but it goes far away from the space exploration, is what are we as humans using this machine achievement for? It's when your hands are free, when you are not engaged in daily labor in order to guarantee your daily living, how do you capitalize your time resource? Because time is the only resource which cannot be replenished. If machines do your work, you have time. How do you become this pinnacle of creation, the human being, as opposed to a life form, biological life form? For me, it's a big question. I'm guilty of it myself. I also like to sit back, watch television and chat to my girlfriends. I'm not certainly in a daily routine of permanent self-improvement, but it's getting worse and worse because it's becoming more and more readily available. And of course, the more machines there are on Earth, the more freedom of time resource is made available to people. So would we as humanity be able to survive this? this extra luxury of freedom? Are we responsible enough? Are we mature enough to handle it responsibly, the luxury of freedom? I personally, unfortunately, not convinced. Mm. Yeah, I can uh, feel your pain there. And Alex Collier has been saying for years, that Earth is the only civilization in the Milky Way galaxy that uses money. And how can you hear that and not think, well, it's time for us to get off the bandwagon and join the club and get with the program? Because money has obviously been used as a form of enslavement. And that is not the way we need to go about space races, apparently. So regarding that, do you have any comments on how we are the only ones who use money? Well, again, I'm also not familiar with the works of this distinguished gentleman you mentioned, so I cannot comment from my own experience. I find it a bit far-fetched to make declarations on behalf of the Milky Way, 
because again we have humans flying to low Earth orbit and yes doing some extraordinary work in the extravehicular activity in spacewalks but this is all an attachment to the surface of the space station at 400 kilometers 300 miles away from Earth. Uh, Milky Way is a galaxy we live in so I would find it a bit let's say metaphorical let's call it metaphorical I believe it's a metaphor this gentleman used to describe his opinion about money so first of all there is no way anybody can know for sure if there is something in the galaxy which operates in economic terms which is familiar to us or which are similar in any way to us secondly again I'm not an economist for sure but I believe that money is a construct, is a measurable construct of quantifying the exchange value. Here we're again then talking about, sorry, back in USSR because the target of communism, I know it's broadly in philosophical and uh, political economical sense broadly misinterpreted by the Western world because actually by the definition, classic definition of communism, communism is a society where everybody contributes by their capability and receives back by their demands, by their needs, by their requirements. So it, you are honestly doing your best to do meaningful work and you can have back anything you wish to have. That's the definition of communism. And in that system, there is no money uh, because simply everybody is conscious enough to do their best to produce and everybody is responsible enough only to consume what they really need and like to have, but not be ridiculously consumeristic. So again, lack of quantifiable currency, whatever you call it, money or you name it, for me it's a totally different level of consciousness which from all my observation is counter to human nature. So if there is somebody in the galaxy who are living similar to us but they are doing the transactions in money free or compensation free way it means that these creatures are not like us because it means that their level of consciousness and responsibility is totally different to the one at which we are as a human race are living right now. Yes, of course, and it'll only be a matter of time and nobody wants to give dates because when you give dates of what happens in the future, you often get egg in your face when things don't happen, when there's a lot of people, I'm not going to name any names, but there's a lot of folks out there who have given dates when they say Ascension is going to happen. We're all going to be burping butterflies and farting rainbows and everything will be happy, joy, joy. But well, that... well I believe there was a forecast end of the world in December 2012. So, and mind there are my, many more ways of getting eggs and cakes into your face this this year unfortunately so we don't even need to make unrealistic forecasts we can get hit for much uh, more trivial things sadly well there is a lot of astrological significance coming up i've i'm sound like a broken record of course but the um Solar eclipse, have you uh, looked into this, the solar eclipse that is going to transverse America in 2024? That will signify uh, the end of the Roman Empire of the modern era that is America and will issue uh, a new age. Maybe this I, will be where, when Asgardia will... Uh, I'm not familiar with this notion, but I, for sure, again, I'm now sounding like a broken record. I would love things to evolve by building up on the positive outcomes of what has already been achieved. I'm the last person who would support the conversation saying, hey, something sinks down so something else can blossom. No, I'm a firm believer that the only way forward is by analyzing what has been achieved and capitalizing on the positive achievements. So if it was up to me, I would say that I hope that the progress in 
what did you say 2024 of America and of Asgardia and of any other countries on earth is such that we come closer together in the comprehension that space is the military free zone that personally bothers me much and that's totally in line with the interest area of Asgardia to maintain global space access equally and to make it military free zone. And we hope, of course, that by promoting this global peaceful approach, the world will be uniting with Asgardia playing significant role as an independent, relatively new player who is supporting total uh, peaceful use of outer space for equal benefit of entire humanity as it's been defined in international legislation since last century. Yes, and well, at this point, I think I might as well um, call it a show. We've got a lot of information out there, but if you want to uh, get anything you like, uh, now's your chance. Get out your contact info, anything that you see for the future, yeah. anything. Yeah, with pleasure. Uh, so, dear listeners, uh, first of all, Thank you very much, Andrew, for having me. It's been a wonderful way of spending the night. It's close to two o'clock in the morning for me here, and I'm very, very awake in a very joyous way. So thank you for keeping me this wonderful company. Everybody is welcome to join Asgardia. For this, you just go to asgardia.space and log in, create yourself a profile. There is plenty of information there. You can write to citizens at Asgardia Space, if you have specific questions, check out our frequently asked questions. Dr. Igor Ashurbeli has founded Asgardia for everybody who wants humanity to live in eternity in space in the universe. So if this resonates with you, Asgardia is for you. This is your way to join like-minded people worldwide. This is your way to shape the future of humanity, because that's what Asgardia does. It cares about the survival of the entire humanity, the betterment of humankind. And this is the purpose of you joining Asgardia. This is your chance to make a difference, to have your impact on the future of our world, of human beings as a race. Asgardia.space. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank I you. will upload this and I will send you the link when I upload it. Good luck and thank you. Namaste. And I hope you I hope you join us, Guardia. Hope so too. Take care. Bye bye.